translational methods for uh, genomic assisted reading and barley. And finally, finished up his education with a postdoc at Cornell uh, where he worked on genomic selection. Uh, currently, Dr. Endelman works at the University of Wisconsin Madison and is an assistant professor uh, in the horticulture department. And his current research focuses on uh, potato breeding and genetics. So, with that, uh, let's uh, I'll hand it over to, to Dr. Endelman. Thanks, Colin. Make sure I have work. We're set up for the mic. Okay, appreciate that. It's, a, it's really an honor to be here, invited to this symposium. And if that short biography tells you anything that you don't always know where life will take you. Um, so hopefully for the students in the audience, you know, keep an open mind about where you're headed in your own careers and don't be afraid to take some risks and to make some changes. Uh, I know I certainly have and I'm really happy where I ended up. This is my first year um, in the, on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin. and um, you know, amazingly, of all things, I'm trying to be a potato breeder, which is something I would never have predicted when I was an undergraduate studying chemical engineering. <coughs> um, but so uh, potatoes, as you may not know, are actually quite an important crop in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin's the third largest producer of potatoes nationwide after Washington and Idaho. And all the different types of potatoes are grown in the state uh, for potato chips, french fries, and also for the fresh market. Uh, the breeding program, actually, it's got a, quite a long tradition. It dates back to the 1930s, so it's a real um, honor to, to be in that, in that setting. Uh, Stan Peloquin, um, <coughs> Jiming Zhang, and Jiwan Palt are some of my predecessors running the breeding program. Uh, just a bit more about the geography of Wisconsin, the breeding program. Uh, I'm based in Madison, but potatoes are grown um, you know, in the northern parts of the state of Wisconsin, so I spent a lot of time traveling. Uh, our, the major part of the major center for potato production in Wisconsin is in the center part of the state, which is a very different geology. It's called the Central Sands, so it's a you know, irrigated sand production for the commercial um, vegetables. And our breeding station is all the way up here in Rhinelander, <coughs> um, in the northern woods. Um, so it's a four-hour trip to our breeding farm. But I have a, a really great team there that that works with me to to do our crosses and maintain the seed for the breeding program. So it's a, it's, a, it's a learning experience, but I'm really enjoying it. Um, but potato breeding has been a very traditional, um, you know, a very traditional process based on phenotypic selection. <coughs> and here just showing, you know, kind of the, the plethora of traits. I mean, every crop you can, you can argue has a very complex set of traits that you're selecting for. But based on my experiences in, in small grains, uh, it's kind of staggering the number of traits that we have to look at and how easy it is for breeding lines to be rejected. Um, for, for defects in any one of these processing or storage um, and, and, uh, and, and so on. And of course, we, we are, we're trying to always balance the resource allocation problem. That's a big part of plant breeding. How many genotypes can you afford to do and how many, uh, how many plots can you use and, and so, on, so forth. So right now we're targeting about 50,000 unique genotypes each year. And by the fourth field year, we've, we've winnowed that down to several hundred. And of course, uh, we're, we're ramping up them the size of the plots that we're using and the number of locations as we go through that. So pretty typical type of uh, figure there for what a plant breeding program is all about. Um, so as I mentioned, potatoes has been a very traditional breeding uh, process, but we're trying to inject some, some modern ideas and, and really the, the sequencing of the first potato reference genome a couple years ago and now the the use of genotyping by sequencing, and we have a, an Illumina array. I mean, it's really changing the landscape very quickly. And uh, I think it's a fun time for me to be involved with my background to, and bringing that to the potato community uh, and to learn from them about their experiences with the biology and the systems. Um, so it's an exciting time. So this is just a bit of a shameless plug for anyone who's interested in working on potato breeding. And if you're not scared about working on autotetraploids, um, look forward to, to hearing from you and let me know if you'd like to, uh, to be a student or a postdoc with me. OK, but it's all very new. This is, I mean, I've only been in the job for nine months. So I'm actually not going to present any results from my work at Wisconsin to you today. I'm going to fall back on some older things from my work at Cornell as a postdoc. I am also struggling with <coughs> a little bit of laryngitis, so I will probably pause to drink quite a bit. <coughs> all right, so I've listed the other three. Th Three things I want to talk about. I just want to warm up a little bit and, and, and get us all on the same page about what is genome-wide selection. I mean, nowadays it's hard to, in this kind of an audience, probably everyone has some idea of what it is, so I don't have to start from scratch. But I still wanted to 
introduce it a bit more. And then we'll get into the meat of it, and there's two topics I want to discuss. One <clears throat> is related to um, kind of an improved method for estimating genomic relationship from markers, and that methodology is called shrinkage estimation. Um, and that's probably of interest more to aficionados of genomic selection, but I'll try and make it interesting for everyone. The last thing here, resource allocation, is something that everyone here thinks about, and so hopefully what I have to say about how markers change the resource allocation picture will be of interest. I'm just going to put my acknowledgments here up front. Uh, <clears throat> this is work done while I was at Cornell, and in part, uh, especially the resource allocation was done using the data from CIMIT, which is the International Center for Maize and Wheat Breeding. Uh, the work was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and also the Agricultural Research Service. And I, there are a lot of people involved, but I want to, in particular, acknowledge John Lipjanik and Gary Allen, who were my, my postdoc mentors. Okay, so let's just start with recapping what is, what is genome-wide selection. Well, it's, a, it's an idea and a technique for trying to select, uh, <clears throat> make predictions and make selections for traits that have a complex genetic basis, meaning that they're highly polygenic, which, as most of you probably know, a lot of our traits of economic interest fall into that category. Um, it's useful to make a distinction between whether you have phenotypes available for the selection candidates or you do not have phenotypes available. Um, I actually kind of just recently, this is a distinction that one of my colleagues at Wisconsin is making quite a bit, and it's, it's useful, I think. So the term marker-assisted selection, I'm going to try and reserve specifically for the case when I have phenotypes available and markers, as opposed to marker-based selection when I only have marker data available, and the, the uh, accuracy for selection is coming exclusively from phenotypes on other individuals. Um, why is genome-wide prediction and selection a hot topic in the last five years? Why is it changing the way we do plant breeding? Well, you know, two things that I, I see as being the main drivers were that, one, uh, we now have an appreciation of how the different statistical methods can be used um, and how they're, they're, they're an improvement over the traditional fixed effects types of models. Um, and we also have the software to do this routinely on a massive scale, so that's important. But also, markers are very cheap right now, so it's cost effective to use lots and lots of markers on your selection candidates. Um, even if we'd had the software 10 years ago, uh, <clears throat> uh, which we may have had some ability to do this 10 years ago, the markers were so expensive that it wouldn't have made economic sense to do genome-wide prediction. So um, <clears throat> there's a lot of complexity you can get into when you talk about genome-wide prediction models, but really you can get 90% of the way there by just using a simple approach, which is to assume that all of the markers uh, the effects of the markers are independent and identically distributed random effects. And uh, the, the type of methodology, and that kind of a, a model is what we call BLUP. Um, that's hopefully familiar to many of you. So when you make that assumption, you can use BLUP to make the prediction there. In the context of genomic prediction, this is specifically called RR BLUP for reasons that I'm not going to really get into. But just to kind of show you empirical results to, to, to drive home the point why the assumption that the assumption of making uh, that the markers are all having a random effect actually is better than the, the what I naively think is the, the smarter approach. Here's an example from a wheat breeding program at Cornell. This is the accuracy on the vertical axis plotted um, comparing two different methods for a number of wheat quality traits. So in blue, is the uh, MLR stands for multiple linear regression, which would be kind of the old paradigm would be you would first do some kind of QTL analysis. In this case, it would have been an association analysis. You would do the QTL analysis, and then you would pick the significant markers, and then you would build a multiple linear regression model to make a prediction. And you might think that, well, I'm picking the significant effects, and so that should be better. But in fact, it doesn't work better. Uh, just using all the markers and not doing any pre-selection uh, in the red you can see how you have a higher prediction accuracy for every trait that they studied. And again, this is just one of dozens of examples that you could show this phenomenon. Um, some jargon that I'll be using, and it's, it's here on this slide, so let me take a moment to define that. Uh, when we talk about a training population in, in uh, genomic selection, that refers to the set of individuals that are being phenotyped and genotyped. And we're going to, make, we're going to use that training population to make predictions. You may make predictions about the same individuals that you have used in the training population, or you may make, that's the marker-assisted selection, or you can make predictions about a different set of selection candidates, in which case you may refer to them as a validation population, and that's, for example, what the TP and the VP stand for here. Okay, so this just kind of illustrates why people are doing genome-wide selection. Uh, <clears throat> this is a technology, though, and it's not a panacea. Uh, I think 
it's important to have a realistic expectation about what genome-wide selection can do for a breeding program. And part of it, to, to, in order to use the technology uh, responsibly, you need to start to understand what are the determinants of prediction accuracy. And so here I list some of them. This is sort of when I teach genomic selection to graduate students, one of the first things we cover. Um, so here we go. One, the heritability of the phenotypes in the training population. Phenotyping matters. And if you have poor quality phenotypes, you will get poor quality predictions. Uh, <clears throat> two, marker density. Uh, more markers is better, but only up to a point. And how many are actually needed depends upon the genetic structure of your population and other factors. The next two here are really important. Uh, the, the number of individuals, that's the training population size. So more is better, generally. But the caveat about size is that it's not just about numbers, it's not just about quantity, it's also about quality of the population. And that's what this fourth point is trying to emphasize, that the relationship between the training population and the selection candidates is, is important. Um, and and uh, just to, I wanna, this next, slide, next few slides will illustrate that point. Um, here is, here is a, some results from a set of uh, maize doubled haploid populations. Uh, the study I, I was involved with, but the primary work was done by Christian Riedelsheimer from the University of Hohenheim. <coughs> and this figure shows the effect on prediction accuracy, that's the vertical axis, as a function of the, here he calls TS, or training set, the number of phenotyped individuals. And this type of um, asymptotic curve is, is a very generic feature that you'll see in genome-wide prediction. So uh, <coughs> our prediction ranges, the accuracy ranges between zero and one. Accuracy is a correlation between your prediction and the true value. In this case, we don't have the true value, but we used an observed phenotype to estimate what the accuracy would be. So as the number of phenotype individuals goes to zero, accuracy has to go to zero. And as the number of phenotype individuals goes to infinity, then the accuracy approaches one. So you, you necessarily have to have this kind of a hyperbolic shape. Um, and, and you can see that the, the different, different, different traits in this example, you, the, the different traits have different curves, but that general trend is always present. <clears throat> but here's where the relationship starts to be an important factor. So here's an example from uh, an analysis of 7,000 sheep. I love animal breeding uh, data sets. They're just huge and they're really interesting to work with, even though I'm a plant breeder. Here's an example of 7,000 sheep. Um, <clears throat> this is a study that I wasn't involved with, but here they were trying to understand, again, what are the drivers of accuracy? And <clears throat> they, they compared two different things. On the, on the left, they compared the accuracy of their predictions against the average relationship between the individual that they're predicting and the rest of the training population. And as you see, that, that, that's a very poor fit. The, the average relationship between the individual that's being predicted and the, and the training population does not explain accuracy. What does explain accuracy is the average of the top 10 relationships in the training population. So that just emphasizes that you can add a bunch of other individuals, and if they don't have a close relationship, and you have already a set of individuals with close relationship, just adding those additional individuals will have a very marginal, little to no effect. So it's, again, it's not just about numbers, it's about the quality of the um, type of relationship that you're looking at. And this next figure, back from the Riosheimer et al. paper uh, with the maize uh, double haploid populations, illustrates that, that impact of relationship in an, also in a really nice way. This was a set of interconnected biparental families. So <clears throat> there, were, there were four uh, parents, A, B, C, and D. And let's imagine that we're trying to make a prediction within family uh, A by B. And we have at our disposal, we can first do the analysis where we say, let's use some of the progeny from the same family with which, in which we're trying to make a prediction. So this is like training on a set of full sieves to what you're trying to make a selection on. And that's the top curve, and you see that it has the highest accuracy. All of these have that same type of asymptotic behavior, but the highest set of, uh, the highest curve occurs when you have full sieves available for training. But that take, if you have to take the time to actually phenotype the progeny from the same family you're making a selection, that's inherently slowing down the rate at which you can ad, uh, advance the cycles in the breeding. So what you'd like to be able to do is maybe use uh, data from a different family where, let's say you have both parents A and B, but in different combinations. So you didn't have the cross A by B, but you had A by C and B by D. So both parents were represented. That's the next series. That, that's, uh, that's the next lowest accuracy. If you only had one of the two parents available, then that would be still lower accuracy. And finally, if you used a different family, C by D, to try and predict A by B. Now, C by D, in this case, is actually from the same breeding program. It's just there's no close relationship. 
but you can see it's the lowest accuracy that, that we had in this situation. So <laughs> this, this kind of illustrates a general principle that I, that I think is sort of like the fundamental theorem of breeding from my perspective, which is that there's always a trade-off between cycle time and accuracy. And you're always trying to optimize that trade-off uh, and how you do it depends upon the, the particular uh, context of the breeding, of how you breed in that particular crop. But here's a case where, you know, you could go really fast if you could just use other families and you didn't have to take the time to actually use either A or B in a cross and you could just use other families to make a prediction. You could go really fast, but you'd do it with low accuracy. And the, and the, and the other extreme is the most accurate, but the slowest. And so ultimately, it's the genetic gain that you're trying to maximize. It's not accuracy, and it's not cycle time, right? We saw the equation from Fabre earlier about it's the genetic gain equation that we're trying to optimize. So that's, that's an important trade-off to think about. All right, well, hopefully that's a bit, that's, that warms us up to just be talking about genome-wide selection, getting a feeling for it. Now let's look at some specific studies that I was um, the primary uh, author on. One is to think about estimating a relationship matrix. And to do that, we're going to shift our focus from thinking about marker effects to thinking about line effects. So um, as I say here on the slide, instead of trying to model the, the marker effects as random effects in a model, you can think about the, the genotypic values of the members of your population as the random effects. That's, or, or what, that's what I call a line effect. And in this case, it's actually a vector, right? So you have, say, a population of size n, you have a, 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 a vector with n entries in it, and that's a random variable. So the marker effect model is called RRBLUP, and the, the line effects model is called GBLUP, the reason being that the typical symbol for the genetic covariance among the members of the population is denoted by the letter G. <clears throat> um, and the, the difference here is that we have to work in, the, when we're moving to the line effects picture, you have to fundamentally work in a multivariate statistical framework. You can't work with these univariate descriptions because G is multivariate normal with a non-trivial covariance matrix. And that covariance matrix is expressed as being proportional to some kind of kinship or relationship matrix that's estimated from the markers. And this relationship matrix is what's often referred to as a realized relationship matrix to distinguish it from a relationship matrix that you would calculate from a pedigree, which is only a relationship based on the expectation under Mendelian segregation. Here we're trying to estimate the actually realization of, of what happened during the, uh, during the inheritance process. Okay, so now I'm gonna even make it a, a finer distinction. Well, that, that's not quite how I wanted to look. But anyway, so the, the letter G, I'm gonna use to refer to the true genetic covariance matrix, okay? which we don't know because the true genetic covariance presumes that you know what they call the loci. And I'm thinking about traits here where we, we certainly don't know now and probably may never know what the true causal loci underlying them are. Um, <clears throat> what we're trying to do is estimate that with markers. And the, the symbol that I'm going to use for the estimator is the G with the hat over it. So the G without the hat is the true thing, which is a parameter that we don't know. We're estimating it. And the estimator is used on the denote with the hat. Now the canonical, what I call, might call the canonical estimator for, for the genetic covariance, the, this realized relationship matrix, is formed by taking the matrix Z, which I didn't I back up a slide, Z here is the matrix of the marker call. So it's got, uh, let's say, M rows, if you have M, uh, sorry, it's N rows if you have a population of size N, and M columns for M markers. You take that matrix, multiply it by its transpose, and that estimator has the interesting property that these two models are equivalent. You can either model marker effects or line effects, and if you model the relationship by that formula, you get equivalent predictions. And that's a, one of the basic principles of genome-wide prediction. But the, 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 true, the, the real truth of the story is that it's not really equality that we should be thinking about when we talk about the GBLUP and the RBLUP models. It's that GBLUP is greater than equal to RBLUP. The reason I say that is because this estimator is not the best estimator. You can improve upon this estimator, and when you do that, then the GBLUP prediction is superior to an RRBLUP prediction. And the way we can improve upon this estimator is by using something called shrinkage estimation. So, okay, what is shrinkage estimation? To work up to that, let's, let's think about a, a trait which is uh, highly polygenic. And so our true genetic covariance is something like a property of the, the, the entire genome. If I wanted to sample across the whole genome, and think about the covariance, that would be my true parameter. But I, all I have is a finite sample of markers. And each marker is a sample from one locus. <clears throat> and if you, um, 
you know, the basic concept of a sample property versus a population parameter. So you, I, mean, I think you're all familiar with, you can take the mean of a sample and it's an estimator of the, of the mean of the population. The same thing's true here. The markers, when you sample from a set of markers, you can construct a covariance matrix, which is the covariance matrix of the sample. And that is exactly what this canonical estimator is. It's the covariance matrix of the sample. And the question is, is this the best estimator of the population parameter, which in this case is the covariance on a genome-wide basis? <clears throat> and uh, the answer is that, well, for large, for high marker density, it's a pretty good estimator, but the, there's, there's at any, in any finite sample, you always have, always have some sampling error. <clears throat> and this error becomes, this sampling error problem becomes worse as the sample size decreases. So in particular, at low marker density, you expect that this canonical estimator is not going to be as good as possible. And you can just think about this also from the perspective of the number of data points you have. Uh, if you have m markers and n observations, the number of marker data points is m times n, whereas this covariance matrix is an n by n matrix, so you have n squared parameters on order of n squared parameters. And when, when the number of markers is less than the population size, then you have too many parameters relative to, you have too many uh, parameters relative to the number of observations, and you would expect shrinkage to be helpful. Now you may, <coughs> You may ask, well, who, who's working in a situation where you have fewer markers than a population size? It is, uh, you know, we've just been hearing about hundreds of thousands of markers. The reality is that still in, in, the, in a breeding application, uh, I think this is still a very relevant situation. You know, when it's not being grant funded and you're doing about trying to actually do this as cheaply as possible, it's not uncommon that you may have a population of 10,000 individuals and you may not have 10,000 markers on every member of that population. So this is still, I think, relevant today. But, Maybe five years from now, it won't be um, such a relevant point. All right, so how does this shrinkage estimation of a covariance matrix work? Well, <clears throat> you have a parameter, delta, which governs the amount of shrinkage. And when delta equals zero, you have no shrinkage. In that case, your estimator, g hat, equals the sample covariance matrix, which I use the letter s to denote. At the other extreme, you may shrink all the way to something which I'll call t for right now, which is t for target. It's a low dimensional target. It's, uh, the point is that it's something which has little, or very few parameters. <clears throat> and in between, for delta between zero and one, you have some linear combination of these things. Now, what are, what, how do you pick a target? Well, in our case, the, the, the most natural target is the numerator relationship matrix estimated from pedigrees. Um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of work in the animal breeding literature in particular, uh, illustrating the importance of using this type of shrinkage estimation uh, they don't call it that, but it's effectively the same thing um, in using an A matrix as a target. I was interested in a situation where we didn't have pedigrees, because that was a lot of the data sets I was working with in plant breeding, we didn't have good pedigree data. It turns out you can still do something in that context. You can construct a target which is just proportional to an identity matrix. Um, and what this is doing is that it's shrinking all the covariance parameters in that G matrix towards zero, as opposed to shrinking them towards the expectation from the pedigree. And it turns out that that is still useful when you're working in a context where you have um, marker-assisted selection. So if you're shrinking a covariance parameter towards zero, you have to have some other piece of information available as a counterbalance in order for this to actually have a benefit for accuracy. And that other piece of information is the phenotype of the selection candidate. So what I'm going to be showing you now is how shrinkage estimation can improve accuracy, specifically in the context of genome-wide marker-assisted selection. How much should you shrink? Well, how do you choose this delta parameter? <clears throat> Uh, the best answer is to determine it through simulation, and you'll see why I say that in a minute. But um, a, a convenient, as it turns out, also very good, but not the very best you could do, is to use a result from statistical theory, which says, let's calculate this delta to try and minimize the expected error of our estimator. So for those of you who like equations, let this, this thing inside the, inside the brackets is the error of the estimation, the difference between g and g hat. And I can calculate the expected value under some uh, statistical assumptions, uh, actually I didn't do this, it comes from the statistical literature, uh, but the result actually is an exact result and it's been incorporated into this uh, software package called R Bluff that I developed and that um, some of you may have used for genomic prediction. So there's a practical application here that you can try it out in your own data sets. Uh, it's interesting to then, I'm not going to give you what the exact result is because it's not very intuitive, but there is a kind of heuristic that can be derived and it, and it has this form. And the heuristic says that the shrinkage intensity delta 
depends upon, on the one hand, the ratio between the population size n and the number of markers. That's kind of what I, the point I was making a few slides ago, that if the population size is big relative to the number of markers, this delta parameter is going to go up. <clears throat> but that ratio is modulated by another factor which is related to the population structure. And the way it's captured in a, in a kind of technical sense is related to the, the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix, which is basically another way of saying a principal component analysis. So um, if you've ever done a principal component analysis and you look at what percent of the variation is accounted for by the first principal component, if it's large, that means you have a structured population. And what that means is that you have a big difference in terms of the magnitude of the eigenvalues from that principal component analysis. That manifests as a large coefficient of variation. You can see that with some, a couple different uh, populations that I analyzed. Uh, here's a commercial pig population in blue, 3,500 individuals. Here's the maize diversity panel that many of you are familiar with. Uh, here's a two-row barley population from the North Dakota State University program. And then the last thing in green, I've amalgamated the two-row and six-row barley programs together, which is, has no meaning in a, in a breeding context because they're separate breeding programs, but I've done it to artificially create a very structured population. If you look, at, for example, at the, the histogram of the relationship coefficients, you can see that structure easily by looking at, say, for the two-row itself, you have a single peak around zero because I've centered the uh, relationship coefficients to zero, but you get a bimodal distribution when you make this two-row and six-row, and, and that's because the, uh, the, the positive values are relationships within each of the two uh, morphologies, two-row versus two-row and so on, and the negative numbers are between the two uh, types in that. Anyways, as I was pointing out, this coefficient of variation, you can see how the highest value, 9, corresponds to this artificially structured population of the two-row and six-row barley. Um, the interesting thing is that for every one, of these pop every one of these populations, it's always the case that the shrinkage intensity will go down as the number of markers increases because you get a better estimate of relationship if you increase marker density. But at a fixed marker density, why, why is it that the, that the two-row plus barley has a low shrinkage relative to the others? Well, it comes back to this ratio of the population size relative to the coefficient of variation. And it just so happened that in this particular situation, although the pig population is like 10 times, more than 10 times the size of the maize population, the difference in the eigenvalue is exactly balanced so that relative to a value of one for the pig population, the maize population was nearly identical. And that's why the level of shrinkage that's expected to be optimal is uh, very similar for those two different situations. So that kind of illustrates a bit about how you calculate a shrinkage intensity. Here's just a result showing you that, as I claimed initially, shrinkage estimation can improve prediction accuracy. Uh, this is based on a simulation, but I also have, um, I'm not going to show you, but I also have results from real data in the pig population that confirm that this is true. So what you're seeing here is uh, two different types of, um, there's two curves in each figure. The dashed one shows the accuracy um, <clears throat> of predicting the, the true genotypic values based on a set of uh, low heritability phenotypes. So in the, what I do is I simulate phenotypes at, uh, I think in this case, like a heritability of 0.3. And then I use that plus the markers to make a prediction about what I think the true genotypic value is. And I correlate that with what the true value is from the simulation. And what you'll see is that in both situations, uh, the, the level of shrinkage intensity that maximizes the accuracy is not zero. There's some level of shrinkage, which it, it, generally speaking, will always go through this kind of peak. Some level of shrinkage is good, but more shrinkage is not so good. So trying to find the optimal level of shrinkage is the goal. And this, uh, this idea of minimizing the mean square error, that's what's shown in the black. And what you'll see is that, it, that the uh, level of shrinkage that minimizes the mean square error tends to be too conservative. It's not, it's not big enough to actually maximize prediction accuracy. And I've observed that in basically every population I've ever looked at. So it seems to be a general principle um, that, the, that this uh, kind of convenient way of determining shrinkage intensity that I've built into the software uh, it's not optimal. If you really want to know, you have to do a simulation like what I'm just doing right here to determine that. So just to summarize what I've tried to convey with this uh, vignette on shrinkage estimation, we just start off by pointing out that, that, the, that the BLUP with a marker estimated relationship matrix is better than the, uh, you know, using only the significant QTL. That's kind of the basic premise of genomic prediction. But when you estimate this relationship matrix, if you're in a regime where your number of markers is commensurate with your population size, you may want to think about using shrinkage estimation as it very likely will improve your estimate of the covariance matrix and that will translate into a higher prediction accuracy. And because of that, I can make the statement that the GBLUP 
model is always going to be at least as good and often better than an otter blood model. <clears throat> what I'm not showing right here, uh, it, but is, is you, can, you can read in this paper, is just to also look at when is this uh, approach um, superior to phenotypic selection, right? I mean, as I mentioned, this type of shrinkage uh, with the identity matrix as the target is useful for genome-wide marker-assisted selection. So your reference, the, the baseline is how good you can do just on the phenotypes themselves. It turns out the largest gains that we observe are relative to, to relative to the phenotypic selection occur at heritabilities around 0.1 or 0.2, uh, which is an interesting regime to be in. And in my experience, it's about the that's about the plot-based heritability for grain yield, <clears throat> um, at least in the number of the data sets I've analyzed. So uh, this started me thinking a bit more about uh, just thinking about how can markers help us with yield trials, and in particular, I'm thinking about a preliminary yield trial where you may only have one or two plots available to estimate grain yield. How can markers help us improve our selection, and how do we allocate resources most effectively in that context? So, <coughs> so the final part here, uh, we're going to be doing, we're going to be asking some questions about resource allocation in a preliminary yield trial. As I mentioned, what is the definition of a preliminary yield trial? It's where you have a few plots available. Um, and we're going to look at the simplest possible case, which is selection within a biparental family. And, and there's really two types of, there's two, there's, there's two groups within a family. One group, you'll have phenotyped and genotyped. And then you'll be trying to make a marker-assisted selection on that group. And then you'll have potentially other progeny that you may only genotype and not phenotype. And you'll try and make a selection on them based on their full SIBs, which is, constitutes the training population in this case. So in order to, to solve the resource allocation problem, we have to work up to it. And the first question I want to pose to you is, if you're limited to, say, one plot per entry, uh, should all those entries be planted in one location, or should you split that trial across multiple locations? And I'm going to answer this now with an empirical, with an empirical data set. Uh, I have a set of, I had a data set, this is the kind of famous uh, barley doubled haploid data sets from the mid-90s where they evaluated them across North America. So we have, I think, eight locations with two years of data. And it allows me to simulate trials of different structures. I can pretend that I only had one location, or I can pretend that I had three locations, because I have eight, lo eight locations to work with. Uh, the trade is grain yield. And <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate, again, as I mentioned, I'm going to simulate uh, taking the entry list and either planting it all in one location, or taking the entry list and splitting it in two different locations or in three locations. I have no common checks here. Okay, so if I use a three location design in this situation, I have, uh, there, there's completely disjoint entry lists in the three different locations. And what the first, this is kind of the, uh, the negative control shows that if you only have phenotypic data available, there's no benefit to doing this. <clears throat> uh, if you, you see that the accuracy is the same whether I use one, two, or three locations, and the accuracy is independent of the number of progeny that I'm phenotyping. Uh, <clears throat> and, and this is what you would expect for, uh, with you, if you don't have marker data. And this provides a baseline for then seeing what happens when you throw marker data into the picture. Well, you, two, two phenomena emerge. One is that the accuracy will go up as you increase the number of phenotyped progeny. That's, the, uh, that's this trend here. And instead of the accuracy going to zero, which is what you observe kind of in the more traditional marker-based genomic prediction, this is a marker-assisted genomic prediction, uh, the accuracy approaches the phenotypic accuracy. And it can approach one in the limit of infinite large population. Uh, you also see that the 1 to 2 to 3, the accuracy is going up as I go to this unbalanced design. And the reason why this is maybe expected is because you're actually able to sample from the target population of environments through the markers. The markers, in a way, connect to different environments. Uh, and because I'm validating in here, in this case, I'm validating my predictions with, a, with the average performance over a set of locations, the earlier I can actually sample from those locations in my testing scheme, the better off I'm going to be in making my selections. So th this is what we tended to call sparse testing at Cornell. I don't think that's a universally accepted term. But um, this, this uh, empirical validation of that idea um, shows that that's true for this Farley data set. And, and you'll see another example in a moment. Uh, the, the effect of this sparse testing on improving prediction accuracy holds not just for the phenotyped individuals. It also carries over to the individuals that you are uh, have only genotyped. And, and <clears throat> in this case, the accuracy is, of course, going to approach zero when you go to zero training population size. All right, so we, oh yeah, and the, this is just to show, uh, this was the, 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 the barley data set come from North America. 
Uh, the maize data come from actually the maize breeding program of CIMIT from East Africa. So you couldn't imagine two different, more different scenarios. And yet this same phenomenon is apparent in both data sets, which tells me that there's really something to this uh, observation here. All right, so I just answered in the affirmative the idea that, that uh, breeders, now that we have markers available, we should be thinking about using unbalanced designs earlier in our yield trial progression. Um, <clears throat> the next thing I want to look at then is the question of uh, the resource allocation. What is the effect of increasing the number of plots per entry uh, on the prediction accuracy? And it's, this is, I'm now going to show the, the maize data, because instead of the barley one here, just to mix it up, um, <clears throat> I've because I just illustrated the, 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 the advantage of using three locations, we're going to fix the number of locations at three. And I'm only going to, I only have one plot available per location, but I could, I could uh, say, say if I had the seed, I could choose to uh, test at any given entry in one, two, or three locations, which in this case corresponds to allocating one, two, or three plots to that entry. And, and uh, what you see is that the accuracy goes up for both the the marker-assisted selection and the marker-based selection. So the left is the marker-assisted, the right is the marker-based selection. And this is not a fixed budget comparison. If I use a three-plot design, I'm spending three times the money. I have three times as many plots. So it's not surprising that the accuracy should go up if I make that additional investment. <clears throat> you can try and uh, to actually make it a more fair comparison. Instead of plant pre presenting the results as a function of the number of uh, lines, which is the number of individuals, I can make the comparison as a function of the number of plots, which is getting closer to, say, imposing a fixed constraint on terms of resources. And there you see that, there, that there's a quite a difference in the way the accuracy behaves for the two different groups. So <clears throat> for the individuals that you are phenotyping, if you take an individual and you go from one plot to two plots to three plots for that individual, your accuracy for that individual goes up. That's what we see in the marker-assisted selection. But in terms of the accuracy on the other progeny that you're only genotyping, it doesn't go up. <clears throat> you see the three curves, which are so separated here, they actually collapse down to effectively one curve, um, which shows that uh, it's kind of a wash. You can either increase the population size and have fewer plots, or you can have a smaller population uh, and more plots, and you get the same accuracy on the, on the, uh, on the unphenotyped subset. So uh, important difference to realize when you're speaking about marker-assisted versus marker-based you know my prediction. Okay, so now we have the ingredients to actually tackle the resource allocation problem. Um, now I'm actually going to impose a fixed budget and make an economic model, and I'm going to use those empirical results that I just showed, which relate accuracy to, for example, the resource allocation and the population size. So I'm going to use that uh, expected accuracy to, to uh, calculate the, the expected genetic gain. Um, and the kind of questions that we're trying to answer here are, how many progenies should I be phenotyping and genotyping versus just genotyping alone? How many plots to use for the phenotyped individuals? And how many to select from each pool? Because they have different accuracies of selection, uh, you want to do a tandem selection in the two groups separately and then composite them together uh, when you make the advancement either for the next stage of the, of the yield evaluation. Now, the economic model here, the, the costs are all based relative to the cost of the, the, the phenotyping cost for one plot. And the, the, the concept of a yield plot unit refers to whatever that cost is. And then we can express the genotyping and line development cost uh, on that basis. And a typical assumption for grain yield would be something like $20 for a yield plot. At least that's what we tended to use at Cornell and Simic. And so um, as I show the results here, I'm going to vary the cost of line development and genotyping from a low of a quarter of a yield plot to a high of two yield plots, which would be, in this case would be something like maybe $5 at the low end to $40 at the high end, which spans uh, you know, most of where public sector plant breeding programs are, I would say. Um, <clears throat> then I'm also going to vary the number of individuals I want to select from that family for advancement. And, those, and, and each, each uh, square in these results shows, uh, tells you what design had the highest expected genetic gain for that choice of parameters. And you, and, and you have to kind of look at all three together to get a picture of what this design looks like. So uh, I've also fixed the total budget for this family at 200 yield plots. That's an important point. The, the solution, the optimal solution will depend upon the total budget. So uh, you have to bear that in mind too. At this budget, which again was realistic for say our CIMIT collaborator at Cornell, um, you see the, the following trend. So one, 
as the cost of genotyping becomes more expensive, the, the, the solution shifts towards smaller populations with more intensive phenotyping for each entry um, uh, and, uh, and, and vice versa. So you can kind of see the outlines where you shift from the one, the two, to three. You can see those, those different phases. This is what I like to call a phase diagram, you know, like solid, liquid, gas, or something like that. It's a similar idea. Um, what was surprising from the study was the bottom right figure. So the, the, the top left figure shows the number of progeny that you're going to phenotype and genotype. The bottom right figure shows how many progeny you should genotype only and make a marker-based prediction for. And it turned out that in this case, the, uh, the optimal solution was to not genotype any additional progeny. So the yellow is zero. For this entire parameter space, you maximize genetic gain when you do not spend money on genotyping additional progeny. It's not until you get down to uh, the assumed cost of genotyping and line development to be a quarter of a yield plot unit <coughs> That, this, that, this, that, that it turned out that now that strategy was uh, one that optimized genetic gain. Um, and that was, so that was the result for, for the barley case study. I saw the exact same result for the yield, for the maize, which is maybe not surprising because, again, the, the accuracy relationships are very similar. So anyways, to summarize some of the take-home messages from this, uh, even when seed or dollars dictate that you have relatively few plots per entry, using an unbalanced design, <coughs> uh, <coughs> Or you have different entry lists in different locations is still advantageous when you have genome-wide markers to, to estimate a relationship. Uh, and the last point here, when you're going to do selection within a full set family, <clears throat> it turns out that genotyping costs have to be fairly cheap. In this case, it looks like to be maybe less than a quarter of a yield plot uh, unit before this marker base, before the, um, yeah, before the marker base selection, meaning the genotype only, before that starts to become an integral part of the design. So, and you can find some more details about this uh, study in, in this paper here. Well, that's it. Thanks for your attention, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Andelman. And we have uh, some time for a couple questions. Jeff. Uh, Thank you for your presentation, very, very clear. Uh, in, in, in your last phase, in terms of resource allocation, you are talking about a quarter of the cost uh, of, of, the, of, the, of phenotyping, right? Is that quarter just genotyping or genotyping and line development? Because I think that you said both things uh, uh, were included there. It, it is the cost of line development and genotyping. Both things have to be a quarter in, this, in, in, in these two different case studies. That's right. Okay. Thank you very much. And so, Jeff, that's really good stuff. Um, thinking about just like logistics, it's, it's easier to plant like all your trials at one location so you don't have to like mm -hmm. pack your combine and move, you take any of that into account or, uh, because obviously you, you'd want to do like a thousand locations with one plot at each, at each yeah. site ultimately. Right. I, I did not have a uh, sort of fixed cost associated with location, but it's, it's a very good point that, that in a more realistic model you would probably want to include that. Jim, did you want to ask a question? In Nebraska trials, we have the opportunity to use irrigation to maximize the uh, phenotype, so to speak, mm -hmm. and the variance that would be associated between the difference between the highest and lowest as opposed to low yield environments where that's compressed. Mm -hmm. How does that aspect of uh, you know phenotyping work with your genomic selection methods, or does it have any impact whatsoever? Um, well, I mean, using a correlated trait to make selection, if you're trying to improve... No, just it, doing, it, doing the testing under irrigation where you can maximize the gene, let's right. say the genetic yield potential, as right. opposed to a low yield environment where the distinctions are smaller between mm -hmm. individuals. I don't know that what I've done has any real bearing on that question, but I think the, the kind of classical ideas about when you can use a correlated trait still hold even when you add genomic markers to the picture. Uh, 
All right, if there's no other questions, lunch is our next activity, and that's over in room number three across here. But before we head, let's give Dr. Edelman another round of applause.